Dear Lord, thank you, as always, as we start to open your word. I do pray, Lord, that you would illuminate your word to us, that what is said and, and, and the efforts that I make to try and tease out what the text is saying would be understandable to people. Uh, and, and I pray, Lord, that whatever I say does indeed point to you. That's it. Uh, it's got to point to you. Uh, you are God manifest in human form. And, and that's that. That's just that. And so, dear Lord, I just turn this message to you. And, and I pray, Lord, that you would honour it and that your name would be glorified. And I pray, dear Lord, that any error is mine. Any error is mine. All glory, all honour is yours. Amen. OK, right, so we're going to continue and pick up with this church in Sardis, right? We're going to um, carry on to do this. And I really want to get this done today. So um, uh, we're going to have a quick read through and we're going to continue to unpack this little letter. So reading from the New Living Translation, Revelation 3, 1 to 6 goes like this. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things that you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I'll come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So last week we covered off verses 3 and some of verse 4, and in verse 4 we saw that Jesus acknowledged that there were some folk left. There was a remnant. Those folk who are loyal to Jesus the Christ, no matter how corrupt the institution of the church becomes, there will always be the relational church that understands the place of Jesus the Christ as head of the body. And as we look back through the history of the church, it is always this way. There is always, always, always a remnant, small pockets of God-fearing men and women who sit outside the, the institution of the church, but who God uses to promote his will and his way on planet Earth. And this remnant, as I said last week, has got absolutely nothing to do with some exclusive groups who consider themselves as vessels of special knowledge or insight. Put simply, this remnant are Christians. They are Christ followers. They are people who understand and acknowledge who Jesus is. Jesus the Christ, the creator God of the universe, by whom, through whom, in whom everything pivots. And in Sardis, as the name suggests, there was also this remnant. Because Sardis, if you remember, there is another name for remnant. Who, as Jesus put it, hadn't soiled their clothes with evil. Soiled or defiled their clothes with evil, it says here. Well, that last part there in the Greek isn't there. So that last part with evil isn't actually in the Greek text. A version like the English Standard Version, which is a much more literal translation, would read it as follows. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. So there's no with evil. For they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So these are folk who haven't soiled or polluted their garments. And that Greek word, soiled, polluted, stained, is a Greek word called uh, moluno. Moluno, and it means, along with that normal usage of soil, polluted, stained, defiled, it's used in the New Testament specifically for those who have not kept themselves pure from the defilement of sin. So within the New Testament, that particular word is used to sort of convey that type of meaning. These are people who have kept themselves pure from the defilement of sin. And I think that's quite important for us to note because all the way through Revelation, this book of Revelation has a really Jewish feel to it. If you study Revelation properly, you will see that there is a real Jewish feeling to it. The way it uses language, the way that it borrows concepts and ideas that would be recognisable to an average Jewish listener. And here there is at least, I think, a nod, um, certainly a nod, towards the, the purity laws that all Jewish folk would understand very well. And I remember, Sardis was full of Jewish people. 
It had lots of Jewish people there. And purity was central to Israelite society since the days of Moses. And it was associated with a small group called the Essenes, who we, you will all know about, came out of Qumran. They were, they were the pure ones, and they wore white. Even within the secular Greek-Roman society, white was considered to be an indication of purity. And when you're living under such sort of stringent regulations around purity, as they were back in that era, then when you wear white clothes, it makes it really easy to see the tiniest little stain on you. Really easy. And it's those tiny stains that would, would help determine if someone was indeed <coughs> impure or whether they'd been polluted. And if they had, they could then be excluded from certain rituals or activities. We see in the book of Leviticus that there was a whole law around what to do with a leprous garment. That's found in the, uh, Leviticus 13, 47 to 59. They'd have to wash it. They may even burn it with fire. Also in Numbers 19, there's the fact that you can actually be defiled by death. A dead body, dead bones or a grave could defile you. And the person defiled in this way, well, they had to go through various ceremonial cleansings and they had to wash their garment or clothes in order to become clean again. In fact, in a section on death written by Solomon, for the sake of argument, uh, he notes in his writings in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 8, let your garments be always white, let not oil be lacking on your head. A white garment, purity, undefiled, not tainted by death. And you think of that imagery in terms of how Sardis was described. <coughs> Sardis was a dead church. It was a dead church. Death defiles all that touch it. And death defiles all that it touches. And it makes things unclean. But there were some folk in that church in Sardis who weren't defiled, who weren't soiled by the, by the deadness that wrapped around that little church because there was a remnant there. They may have been weak, but they were faithful to the Lord. There was a remnant. Sardis was once upon a time alive, but it was now dead. Christ was once dead, but is now alive. Jesus the Christ, the resurrection and the life, stands there in the midst of this congregation in Sardis to revive this dead church. If only they would focus on him. And it's all about him. It is all about him and how he deals with the removal of pollution, defilement or sin. And later on in the book, the faithful are described in that manner, actually, in that book of Revelation. You look at Revelation 7, Revelation 7, 13 to 14. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, talking to John, who, who, are these, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you are the one who knows. And then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. The robes have been made white by the blood of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus. <clears throat> They've not been made white by a belief in God. They have not been made white by a belief in gods. They have been made white by washing their garment in the shed blood. The atoning sacrifice of Jesus the Christ, the God-man. And it is this God-man who stands in the middle of his flagging church looking to revive them. If only they would turn to him. If only they would turn back to him. And now we come to what is the first of what's in effect three promises that are offered to this remnant of believers in Sardis. You see, it's these believers who will walk with Jesus Christ in white because they are considered worthy and I think that implies that these believers will walk with Jesus when he returns in triumph. We'll touch a little bit more into that as we unpack the next verse, but there is certainly something very suggestive of a triumphant accompaniment. And the reason, 
The reason they can do this is that they have got robes washed in the blood of the Lamb and are therefore worthy. Because the robes are washed in the blood of the Lamb, they are then worthy. So I was interested to see what that Greek word was that the English translates there as worthy. The Greek word is axios, and it means weighing, having weight, having the weight of another thing of the like value. So it's worth as much. So the robes that the believers wear have as much weight and value and worth as the lamb, because those robes are covered by the blood of the lamb. You see, we stand worthy, not because of anything that we do, but because of everything that he has done. And we are covered by him, not because we happen to have value and merit, but because he does. We're covered by him. All our value is derived from him and his achievements. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a lot better about things because it's not about me. It's, it's not about what I do or don't do. It's all about what he has done. So I don't sit in judgment for anything because he has done it. He has taken the judgment. He has secured the beachhead. He's done it all. All I need to do is to allow myself to be covered by him. And if I do that, I am worthy because I am weighted as he is weighted. And he's worthy. That's it. The 24 elders before the throne all cry out, Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. You know, this concept, if we did actually apply it to our lives, is completely liberating. If you think about all the times in your life that you have sat there wringing your hands about things you did or you didn't do, well, guess what? It's not about you, and it's not about what you did, and it's not about what you didn't do. It's about what he is and about what he did. All you have to do is to be covered by him. Talk about the grace of God. Personally, I am very thankful for the grace of God. Very, very thankful. And before anyone here or anyone else that listens to this thinks that I'm advocating a a greasy grace do as you want style of attitude that's not what i'm saying we still have a life to live we still need to hear and remember hearing means to obey doesn't just mean listening it means to obey and we still need to walk a life that honors him you are not saved by works but works and the fruit that they produce is a pretty good indicator of the type of tree that they're from pretty good indicator So for these believers, there would come a day when those who had woken up, those who had demonstrated their loyalty to him throughout their life, would one day share his honour when he returned. Which moves us into verse 5. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I'll announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. The first starts with the same phrase as we've already looked at in previous churches, all who are victorious or to the overcomers. And you will, of course, recall that the one who overcomes is the one who who sits in the faith by belief in Jesus the Christ. The Apostle John tells us about this in 1 John 5, verse 4 to 5, and I've already taught on that, so I don't plan to go over that one again, so I won't repeat myself. You'll be pleased to hear Other than to say that to be an overcomer, there is absolutely nothing that we can actually do other than to sit in the completed works of Jesus the Christ. That's it. That's all we can do. And so in this sense, what it does is it dovetails perfectly with the garments which are made white by the blood of the Lamb. Nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. Nothing I can do. We sit in reliance, in the complete reliance on the person of Jesus. And the verse then mentions again that there's these white clothes or garments. And the overcomers or the victorious ones will be clothed in white. So we'll just touch on this. Sardis had a background in trade and woolens and goods and dyes and textiles and all of that sort of thing. So garments were not an unusual thing there. And outside of this, there was also the Mosaic laws, the teachings of the Essenes. uh, And there's also some other things that were carried out in the Greek Roman world, all talking about white garments. 
You know, if there was a celebration for someone uh, in Rome or in that area uh, following a Roman battle or triumph and someone was being honoured, then the following would happen. All work ceased and the true Roman citizen donned the pure white toga. The specially privileged few, usually the civic authorities and sometimes relations or friends of the victorious general who was being honoured, had a part in the triumphal procession. White garments were symbolic of someone's good or even great works or achievement, along with aligning with the image of purity and freedom of defilement and pollution. Not to mention that going into a pagan temple, you would change into white garments to approach the temple in order to perform your pagan rituals because to approach the divine, you needed to be clothed in white. And here, Jesus is saying that everyone who overcomes would be clothed in these special garments, much like the victory celebrations, much like the purity requirements, because these garments would be an outward testimony declaring victory purity and transition to a glorified state in him because it was his blood it was his blood that those garments were all washed in and i think that too is something that was really worth noting particularly as it links back to the sort of jewish way of doing things you see we actually sort of touched on this in in the reading on hebrews i think In, in leviticus 16 we were given an insight into the day of atonement and the ceremonies that are all wrapped up in that. In Leviticus 16, the high priest has to put on his white linen garment before heading into the Holy of Holies. And then what he has to do is he had to sacrifice a goat as a sin offering. He had to sacrifice a bull as a sin offering. And once that and a number of other things and rules he had to do, he was then to remove all of his clothes before entering the meeting tent again. Think about that. A white garment being used while animals are being sacrificed. What is the garment going to be covered in? Blood. There is so much in this atonement ritual that speaks of Jesus. So much in it. I won't pull it all apart here. You'll be pleased to hear. Otherwise, we'll be here until about three o'clock. Yeah, and we don't want that. So anyway, suffice to say, the high priest is clothed in a white garment. A white garment that is covered in atoning blood through the animal sacrifice. And our high priest, Jesus the Christ, is the atoning sacrifice. And it is his blood that now covers us, allowing us entry to the Holy of Holies. And it is our high priest, Jesus the Christ, who was transfigured. Remember? Transfigured? Mount of Transfiguration? He was transfigured. And he's described in these terms, Matthew 17, 2. As the man watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Mark 9, 2 to 3. As the man watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. The atonement the divinity, all wrapped up in the person of Jesus the Christ, done and dusted. And that verse then continues that Jesus will never erase those worthy, i.e. those who are covered by him and his achievements. He will never erase those. It's those folks whose name would never be erased from the book of life. The book of life. Let's just appraise ourselves of some of the, uh, for want of a better description, heavenly books. There's a number of heavenly books in the in the book Um, i'll add the references for you to have a look at but um, i'll just mention a few of them we've got the book of the living with the book of the living which is all presently all of those who are presently alive on the earth saved and unsaved and you can read about that in exodus deuteronomy in the psalms and isaiah the book of the living you've got the book of the names of the lost and deeds you can read about that in revelation 20 you've got the book of the names of the elect found in daniel and in revelation You've got the book that contains the names of the faithful followers of the Lord in Malachi, Philippians, Hebrews and Revelation. Now, that may sound pretty odd in our sort of day to day living, but it certainly wasn't odd in the Jewish understanding of things. You see, think about this. We've got a a, a significantly Jewish focused, Jewish written book of Revelation. It's very, very Jewish in the way that it's put together. Moses came down to Israel with the Ten Commandments and he found them all up to evil badness. He 
come down with the Ten Commandments and what are Israel up to? They're up to evil badness. And he has this conversation with God in Exodus 32, Exodus 32, 31 to 33. Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, what a terrible sin these people have committed. They've made gods of gold for themselves. But now, if you will only forgive their name, but if not, erase my name from the record that you have written. But the Lord replied to Moses, no, I will erase the name of everyone who has sinned against me. King David, in his psalm, Psalm 69, makes this petition to God. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Pile their sins up high and don't let them go free. Erase their names from the book of life. Don't let them be counted among the righteous. Or if you were to go to that incredible book of Daniel, you'd read this, Daniel 7, 9 to 10. I watched as thrones were put in place and the ancient ones sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. And then the court began its session and the books were opened. We already touched on the heavenly books. So this concept of keeping books, keeping records, isn't something that was unfamiliar in the Jewish culture. And as we read this part of Revelation, our focus is on the book of life. And the book of life, as we're shown it here, has a dual focus. There's two things going on with it. There are the names that are written, and there are the names that are erased or blotted out. So what does that mean? And more importantly, perhaps, what does it not mean? You look at that section of the verse. I will never erase. Now this, in the, we, we miss it in the English, but this in the Greek, the negation here in the Greek is a double negative for emphasis. This is the strongest possible form of negation in Koine Greek. Nothing is stronger than that. Nothing is stronger than this in terms of en- emphasis. Jesus will never, 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 ever, 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 ever remove the names of those who are worthy, those who are weighted like he is, who are covered by him and his sacrifice. Never, never. It can't be any stronger in the Greek. Never. He'll never erase them from where? The book of life. And the book of life is a metaphor for eternal life. If you are covered by Jesus the Christ, you have eternal life. And nothing, ever, nothing, nothing. Think about that. No thing, nothing, ever, never, ever, ever, ever will take that from you. Ever. Now erasing or blotting out the name from the book of life is also a metaphor and it's a metaphor for judgment a metaphor for judgment so you are either covered by Jesus the Christ and his blood soaked garment and therefore you stand in eternal life or you are not and if you are not you are awaiting judgment And again, this speaks so very well to the culture and to the context back in the day. Because practically every ancient city back in that day held a role or a civic register. And in this record was a name for every child that was born into that city. And normally that name was obliterated from the record at death. If a citizen was guilty of treachery or disloyalty or had been brought into shame for some reason or other, then they were subject to public dishonour. And this would take the form of expunging their name, removing their name from the city register. They were no longer deemed worthy to be considered a citizen of the city. There's a flip side to that as well. If the citizen had performed some outstanding act or or exploit that was deserving of special recognition or or distinction, then honour was bestowed on them. So there are pretty much two ways this would happen. Either by recording the, the deed in the city role, or by the name being encircled and overlaid in a, in a rich gold, actually in the roll. So the name would stand out. And Jesus' statement here, when you link it to the societal practices, implies not just that the name of the overcomer wouldn't be erased ever, but it's also really suggestive that it would be inscribed in gold. 
highlighted, just like the way the city does it. This verse is not teaching about a loss of salvation. It is a means of stating that the one who is victorious, the overcomer's name, would be especially glorious forever. The main purpose of this promise from Jesus is to provide certainty and assurance to those who are worthy. And it certainly isn't to indicate anything about the fate of those who do not overcome or those who aren't considered worthy. And it most certainly should never be used as a proof text to support any doctrine about losing your salvation. That's not what it's written for. It is not once saved, always saved. It is if saved, always saved. You are saved by grace through the faith in Jesus Christ. You are not saved by good works. Neither are you unsaved by bad works once you are saved. Not if salvation is by grace. But you will be rewarded for your works And your works, as I've said earlier, give a real good indication of your spiritual state as to whether you are saved or unsaved. Because the fruit the tree produces speaks volumes of what kind of tree it really is. And Jesus then goes on with this acknowledgement, which I think is quite amazing. Jesus Christ will acknowledge all overcomers, victorious ones, who are worthy as his own. And this takes me back to the book of Matthew when Jesus is there and he says the following. He sent his disciples out and he says to them in Matthew 10, 32, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. And again, this has such a Jewish feel to it when we consider that Jesus is our high priest. You see, back in the day, Aaron, the high priest, he would go into the sanctuary of God and he had upon his heart the, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel in, in the 12 stones in the breastplate of judgment. He also bore the names of the 12 tribes on two onyx stones, six names on each shoulder as he came before the Lord. The names of God's people were ever represented before God in the form of the high priest of Israel and before the presence of his glory in the tabernacle of God. And Jesus the Christ... Our high priest mirrors this as he announces the names of the worthy. And those names, he says, are inscribed on the palms of his hand. Not only this, though, it speaks so beautifully to the era in which all of this was written, because it alludes so well to the process of the returning warrior, the faithful men that that would wear the white toga of the freeborn, those who would walk in the triumphal procession with the victor. And it's then in the presence of the emperor and in his court, the victorious general relates the deeds that his warriors had done, their incredible exploits in the battle, they're spoken of, and and these warriors are, are presented before the court in acknowledgement of their worth. Likewise, those worthy Christians would be brought into a banquet, clad in festal robes, their names honoured in this heavenly book, and ultimately confessed before the sovereign of the universe, as Jesus recounts the deeds of his followers and presents them to the Father. Three promises covered by Jesus. Gifted eternal life, and announced before the Father. Covered by Jesus, gifted eternal life, and announced before the Father. And as I said last week, all those promises are fulfilled in Jesus the Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ, with a resounding yes, and through Christ our Amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. The Christians in Sardis would have felt really encouraged to, to, to live in keeping with their calling. And the letter then closes off, doesn't it, with that familiar phrase, I don't plan to go over again. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So in terms of the prophetic profile prior to this church age, heathenism, paganism was Christianized. Pagan temples became Christian churches. Heathen festivals were changed into Christian ones. 
Sardis portrays the Reformation, the denominational church, which covers from the split with the Roman Catholic Church all the way through to the missionary movement. The reformers had managed to instigate a return to to doctrines of salvation by grace, doctrines of the priesthood of all the believers. They challenged the pagan traditions that had been embellished into what it meant to be Christian. And during this period of reformation, the Protestant church, they had a reputation for being sound to start with. But ultimately, spiritually, they died. In many respects, they were quite dead because there was no consensus on many of the doctrines that came out. And the result of this was denominations and denominations have fragmented the church ever since. They have destroyed unity. They have blighted the testimony of the body of Christ. During the Reformation period, there were a faithful few who held to the truths of the scripture that the Reformation had rediscovered. And those few did not agree with the errors of the leaders of the church that were sat within the institution. As to be expected, this letter spoke perfectly to the church when it was written. It spoke perfectly and it speaks perfectly into the church age that it represents today. Ephesus was once desirable, backslidden, The believers had let go of their first love and their devotion to Jesus the Christ, representing the apostolic church from the departure of Jesus until the times of persecution and the split from mainstream Judaism. Smyrna, the crushed, dying church, they were satisfying his heart, representing the persecuted church, covering up until the time of Constantine. Pergamos, Well, the mixed marriage objectionable church filled with confusion and compromise. This is when the church married state covering from the time of Constantine all the way up to the rise of the papacy. And then you get to this Thyatira church, Thyatira, the church that tolerated pagan practices. They overlaid Christianity on top of all of these pagan rituals. And this represents the medieval church. And it covers the fracturing of the universal church, the Catholic church. It covers the rise of the Roman Catholic church and the thousand years leading up to the Reformation and beyond. Sardis, the church that we've just been working through. The church that had a name but failed to live up to its promise. Relying on self rather than relying on Christ. And this is represented by the Reformation or denominational church age, covering from the 1600s up to today. We need to recognise the patterns that scripture show of how the institutional church is going to track over the centuries and where we sit today in that pattern that's being played out and what that means for us. And we should consider this letter to the church in Sardis as a health warning for us today. Modern day Sart is a corruption of Sardis's ancient name and likewise the denominational church today is a corruption of all that was gifted gifted to it through the reformation this should have been a time to reach back and find unity didn't happen it reached back all right but what it did is it reached back and it spawned and it continues to spawn disunity continued fragmentation And with continued fragmentation, you end up with nothing. In Sardis, there was a false confidence which showed in the character of these inhabitants. The church presented itself without reality. It presented presented appearance without reality. It spoke of great promise, but it actually provided very little sign of performance. It had an outward appearance of strength. But this was undermined by its lack of discipline, its inability to keep watch, and its lack of diligence, just like the city which ultimately led to its ruin. The name of this church, Sardis, became synonymous with failure and a job half done. Today, throughout the world, particularly in Western nations, many churches have a reputation for being good. 
maybe due to the building that they've got, maybe due to the church activity or events that they're involved in, or their antecedents, their history. Yet spiritually, they are as good as dead. Because they don't have Christ. What steps give an indication towards this death? Well, when a church starts to worship its own past, or its history, or its reputation, or its name, or the names in the church. When the church is more concerned with forms than with the function and life, i.e. the shape and form of a building should be primarily based upon its intended function, what its purpose is. When a church is more concerned with numbers, but how many bums have we got on a seat? than with the spiritual quality of life that it's trying to produce in its people that come. When the church is more involved with management than with ministry or with the physical over the spiritual. And then you couple all of that with a failure to present the word of God and to effectively communicate and engage the heart, the soul, the mind, the spirit, so that the word can be applied personally and those hearers can then take responsibility to walk by the spirit who indwells them. Church doesn't do any of that. You've got a sure blueprint for a church that will fail and will die. Our task is to walk by faith in his power, to deal with sin through honest confession And if we do, great. If we don't, we will hinder, we will grieve the work of the Spirit. If we do anything otherwise. Today, biblical Christianity is becoming increasingly politically incorrect. Increasingly. And one day, as the church ages play out, which we will see, the true church will eventually be forced underground. It will. J. Vernon McGee says this, the attack against them will be led by the liberal denominational churches. And sadly, I think that is so often the case today. And the result is that great truths are being lost. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone. The God-breathed scriptures. The eternal condition of man. The redemption by Christ and his blood. Each of those statements over the years I've been teaching, I've heard watered down by various churches. The great truths of the Reformation are being lost. And Christ is looking at and expecting something from us. He's expecting something from us. And so we must Listen to what this church is being told. We must wake up. We must keep watch. And we must remain diligent. Not allowing the comfortable nature of our lives to lull us into imbecility or into a deathly sleep. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's just pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. As always, I thank you for your word. Lord, as we continue to work through this book of Revelation, these letters to the seven churches, I pray, Lord, that you would become clearer and clearer to us. This book is all about the unveiling of you. The message to your churches is all about unveiling you. And I pray, Lord, that as we wrap up this this little series, Lord, over the next few weeks with these next two churches, we will see more and more of you and the relevance of you to your church. The church, which is your body, of which you are the head and of which you stand in the middle of. I pray, dear Lord, that you would give us eyes to see you and he is to hear you. May your blessing rest on the folk that are here today, Lord. I pray that you go before them, that you pave their way, and that you walk ahead of them into the week, so that they would indeed honour you in the way that they conduct their lives, and the fruits of their life would demonstrate the condition that they are indeed worthy and covered by you. 
and it is in your beautiful name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.